Hi guys, it's Shayla J. We are back on Quantum Magic and I am so excited because I have Johnny Anton here today. And Johnny, you are doing amazing things right now. You are helping entrepreneurs shift their paradigm in sales, in how they're really approaching the economy today. You have helped entrepreneurs get up to over a hundred million dollars in high ticketed uh, products, selling, you are doing crazy stuff and I just had one of your trainings um, not too long ago I think last week already and it was mind-blowing all of our girls that you got speaking to were just so grateful for everything you had to say and on top of that you are the co-founder of through you.org which is a nonprofit building schools and uh, water wells and now hopefully medical centers that is insane how are you I say you're so <laughs> You're so fun and energetic. <laughs> I love your energy. Love the love. I can just hear the love from you. I, I feel like if more salespeople listen to your <laughs> podcast or working with you, they can just see how to be natural and how to be someone who really cares and authentic. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm honored and very uh, pleased to have served your community. I'm so, so glad that they got a lot of value out of the training. And um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to hearing what some of their results are in the near future. And I'm excited to speak with you today. Yes, I'm so glad you're here. So I kind of want to just dive into your brain and your story and just kind of let us know how did this all start for you? How did you get into coaching people and, and helping people really shift their paradigm and mindset and how they're doing sales and, and where did it start for you? Yeah, it's very interesting. It, it, it's like, you know, when you have a, a, a very like cultural past, I mean, like most people look at me, they're like, oh, he's just an American Irish guy. He's got a red beard. He's got to be like Irish. And, you know, most people don't know this, but I'm actually, my family are refugees from Iraq and they came here in the seventies, eighties and nineties. I'm 100% Iraqi. Uh, from a village called Baghdada, which is like north of Baghdad, 20 miles in the uh, like uh, Mosul, like near Mosul, Iraq, which uh, is 98% Islamic country. And I come from the 2% that's actually the original, at, like almost like Australians or the Aborigines of Australia, the Assyrians from ancient Mesopotamia, are from that land and so ancient Assyria is where my family and culture is from and so my first language is Aramaic and um, and so that's why that's interesting is because my whole culture has been was one of the strongest empires and the most powerful empires that was thriving and then when Christianity came about they threw their arms and became all about surviving and they've experienced actually 3300 genocides more genocides than any human culture, ethnicity group combined, right? Wow. And most people don't know that because it's history from 5,000 years ago. So the contextualization Oh, we lost you, got a little frozen. Johnny's frozen. Temporary technical difficulties. Oh, are we uh -oh. back? Okay, cool. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. So yeah, so my my culture came from being in this thriving, purpose driven culture of being the most powerful empire in the world, other than the Persian Empire, right, and the right. Roman Empire, to surviving and running away. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, And I would have never guessed that about you either. So that makes it so much more cool that you have that backstory. Wow. Yeah. And, and yeah. So, and, and so growing up, I heard my mom tell me the story about how her dad is the which is my middle name, got kidnapped at when she was seven years old, her dad got kidnapped and waterboarded because of his religious beliefs in Christianity by radicalists. And the funny thing is, is like, there's so much misconstrued, there's so much misinformation out there when it comes to Islam and when it comes to violence. And I'm not going to get in too much into that political battle, but 
most of my friends growing up and most of my family's closest friends were Islamic. And there's just a clear distinction of Islamic people and radicalists. And radicalists are not really concerned about religion. It's more about power and money and extort, extorting people. And so my grandpa got kidnapped at a very young age from my mom and he got waterboarded for two weeks. And my, my family offered ransom, offered businesses that he owned. My family lived a very wealthy lifestyle in Iraq. They had a nine bedroom home with maids and, you know, people who were part of the family. And my, my grandpa had farms and restaurants and hotels and real estate. And, you know, and, and the radicalists just didn't like that. And so, um, so, they let my grandpa go after two weeks of torturing him. And he said, I'm not going to even risk this. I'm not going to spend another day here. He sold his businesses for next to nothing as much as he could still owns real estate that we can't get back 40 years later, 50 years wow. later. Um, and he loaded my mom and her four siblings from the ages of five to 10 years old. My mom had five, four siblings, including herself. And because he was a farmer, he loaded up his station wagon back then in, I think it was the late sixties, early seventies with apples and milk crates. And it gives me goosebumps telling the story. My mom told me it so many times growing up, but my, my, my mom and my uncles and aunts, right. Her siblings mm -hmm. were laying underneath these apple carriages, these milk crates filled with apples with just a canvas, like covering them. And they, they, my mom told me about how they were at the border and there was, there was security and army military from the Iraqi government with AK 47s. And my mom, my, my grandma's in the front, my dad or my grandpa's driving, my mom's dad's driving and he gets stopped and he said, Hey, I'm just going to Jordan for the weekend to drop off some apples and sell these apples. I'm a farmer in this village. And they said, well, can we check your cargo? And hesitantly he let them check the cargo and thank God they just pulled back the canvas and saw the apples. But my mom said that the apples were going up and down as my parents uh, were, uh, my, my mom's, were my, my mom and my, my, uh, my aunts and uncles were breathing. And they, they said they had to hold their breath for 30 <sighs> seconds. They felt like it was an eternity. Oh my God. So, yeah. So they got to Jordan, they got through, thank God they got through and nothing happened to them. But if they had been found, they would have been killed right on the spot. And um, if they knew and found out they were fleeing, right? Because the radicalists ran everything. Even if it was government, they ran everything. They, they scared the army, the local army there. And so, you know, my mom lived in Jordan in the refugee camps for two years in Beirut, Lebanon, which she said back then was the most beautiful place in the world. Mm -hmm. And she came here in 1974 and, uh, you know, moved from one of the most dangerous territories in the world to one of the most dangerous cities in the world, Detroit. So wow. funny story. My mom was escaping and surviving only to come into a neighborhood where there's gun violence. And so my mom worked in a convenience store for 25 years in the worst area in Detroit. And I saw a lot of things that people shouldn't be seeing at the age that I was at. And it really changed me and it really shaped who I was. And I developed PTSD from all the violence yeah. and, uh, and, and my house burned down and, and at that time, my house burned down, my mom had breast cancer, and we were going to work in this violent surroundings, and I was just became the victim. Yeah, and, my mom and surviving. Became the victim. Yeah. And so what my sales training is all about is getting out of the victim mentality, getting out of survival, and recognizing that you're not your past, you're not all these things that are happening to you, they're actually happening for you and through you, and that's why my nonprofit's actually called Through You. It's all about getting people out of victimization and doing something about all the world problems when it comes to clean water and education and medicine and how that, you know, we have trillionaires now with Jeff Bezos yet we still have structural issues with having clean water everywhere. And so, yeah. um, so I, I, I related to everything that I do with life happening for me and through me and through you. And so that's why my sales trainer, my sales training takes on this role of getting out of victimization from your past and not having the way you listen, communicate and take actions consistent with the past, but giving up your identity that you inherited and creating a new identity for yourself where you actually are in control and choosing what you do, say, hear, communicate 
on the phone or in person in sales conversation. And to my, to my surprise, it's actually been more beneficial than a lot of the sales training I was brought into with books and courses and sales trainers that, I, that my company that I worked for initially paid millions of dollars to have me get trained. And what I found out was the old sales paradigm based in survival and what I teach is the new sales paradigm, which is based in authenticity. It's based in deeply, uh, deep affinity, really creating a relationship with someone, getting vulnerable as I am today on the, yes. on, on the call with you yes. and, and how that creates a relationship where it's not about the outcome. It's not about the sale, but it's about what people want to create and what their life's in service of and how you help them step into their vision and own their power. That's what my sales training is all about. Oh, I love that. And it's so true because everything's energy. We all have a frequency, but if we're emanating the same thoughts and in that victim mentality, we're just going to keep creating more of that, which kind of goes back to why obviously your mom and, and your family kind of stepped into going right from survival into another city and state of, of survival. But it's so cool that you were able to see it as the win and see it as like, how can I shift into this as like, like you said, life happening for me, not to me and making it a positive shift that is freaking awesome and so many more people need to know that and shift into that. But I think it can also be tough when your 3D reality and the visions you're seeing outside of you are, are, are happening, but you're like, but how do I change it? And you don't really know how, but I think that's why everyone really does need a coach in life, whether it is with sales or with personal life coaching or whatever. So how, what are some like maybe techniques or some things, if you don't mind sharing maybe one or two little things, what would be something you dive into or something you help people with mindset wise or, or maybe childhood trauma wise or something? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you alluded to it with what you just said around coaching and everyone needs a coach. And, um, you know, I even, re I, my first pillar in whatever I teach is language, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about what, I, and we'll come back to coaching because I truly feel that when people see that they want a coach that can really help them, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that coach can help them get to things and places that they didn't even know was possible, right? Um, and we'll come back to that. And everything starts with language, right? When you think, when you go back to 5,000 years ago in the Assyrian empire, right? And I have this tattoo and I, I thought I never would get a tattoo, but I felt like tattoos were great for other people. They look beautiful on other people. I love art. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a big proponent in art Me and too. I really love that tattoos were on other people. I just never felt like I could get something that I truly connected with that I wouldn't resent years later until I decided to just own who I was as an identity. Me too. <laughs> as, a Syri as this Assyrian king in the modern world that's here to change people's lives. And my mess is my message, right? Communication yes. PTSD and what I went through being in trauma and victimization and developing these speech impediments and stutters when I was in, when I was six, seven, eight years old, like I couldn't connect with anyone. And now I don't even skip a beat when I talk because I've made it my whole purpose to help people you know, with communication, because I'm on the path with them and mastering it with them. And so I actually have this Assyrian king, which is Asher Nazarpal, which is the first Assyrian king. I right? love and, it. And it, it, he's in the form of a lama, so you can't quite see it, but it's a wing bull bird. And these statues used to sit in front of the palaces back in ancient Mesopotamia 5,500 years ago when the first Assyrian king was around after he had passed. They built these statues up because they were a polytheistic culture at the time before Christianity made its influence. And these statues would ward off intruders because they were like 18 ton statues. Nobody knows how 5,000 years ago they built these 18 ton statues that were colorful and had the king's face on it. And people, because they were so big and they were so masterful with the way they were sculpted, they think they thought that these statues could come alive at any moment and attack. Them. And so and so these, these statues, if you ever have the honor and privilege to go to the Louvre Museum in France and Paris, or you go to the British Museum in England, oh, I gotta in go. London, you will see these statues as the most revered part of their excavation from the colonial times, the Napoleon times. Uh, the statues from those cultures are uh, like people praise upon them and line up to see my culture. And I wasn't really connected with that as a kid. But when you go, not to get down this rabbit hole, but when you, what, I'm, what I'm connecting to is that way back then, you know, all we used to do was use communication, 
for mm-hmm. things, right? Before we had government, before we had money, before we had all these things, what did we do? Well, we had people and how we were in relation with each other was communication. Yeah. And so the first thing I teach is that language is everything because the world got created when two people or more decided one thing in language, yes. right? Whether it was building a road or building or having a building get created or, uh, you know, naming a village, right? Everything gets distinguished through language, that art piece, that microphone that you're using. Everything uses language to distinguish what is and what is not and what's important and what's not. And so we have to come to understand that our language 99.9% of the time was inherited by our environment. Yes. And so when we say things like I can't or but or I wish, all of those things are communicating to our psychology or subconscious mind, right? Which we know from modern day science and psychology that our subconscious mind is 4,000 times stronger than our conscious self up and alive through our five senses. You know, it's no secret. Yeah. Everyone knows that at this point. If they don't, they just haven't read literature or exposed themselves enough, or they're still in disbelief and they're battling that. And I have sympathy for that. And, and that's my goal is to raise awareness that your language is everything and that it starts with language. So now not to co- correct you or coach you or give you unsolicited advice because nobody likes that. And, so I, I, and I invite you to consider no one needs coaching, right? right? When you get into the battle of need, it's a word that we inherited from the past, which means we didn't create it. We inherited it from people in our environment. And what that immediately does is put us in a conversation of self-worth. Mm. And we don't know that we are not good enough until something happens to us at a young age. And we assign some sort of perception, some sort of worldview, a lens that we take on that event, on life, and it runs us. Look at you coaching me already in here. I love this. It's so true. Right. No, it's so good. Because it's it's just demonstrated for the audience, right? This is the kind of stuff I do. I cut in and I say, hey, I know we're on a podcast, but I'm here to transform lives. If I died today, I would have not made that difference. And that's, I care less about how people think or feel or believe about something and more about making that difference. Yes. To the point where I almost will attract people that will give me negative feedback because, you know, not every when you don't want advice and it's unsolicited, nobody wants it. And so human yeah. psychology, even I know that respect that. And sometimes I have to kind of take a few steps back to take a few steps forward with people who don't receive the coaching as well as you do. So thank you. No, of course. And I love it because it just goes to show that you do know what you're doing. And I know all this stuff, but I'm human and we are programmed. And I still every day work on my programming because I I use languaging that I know is still subconscious. So, and I love that you checked me there and was like, oh, the word need, because it's so true. Like it is a choice. And I think that um, it's, how do I reframe the word need? More like uh, I welcome any coaching and really like and and enjoy it because I feel like it helps me uh, get to higher levels of existence. And that's like ultimately why I'm living and why I want to be here is just to like raise my frequency to the highest level and help other people get there as well, you yeah. know? And I think that what you're doing in your trainings, it, it goes so much deeper than the trainings and then the sales. Like people kind of come out of your training like the way the girls did and we're like mind like okay um this is so much deeper than we realized and it's so true that it's just like all like you said all about languaging and really connecting and and knowing yourself and and self-worth and and all of that all of it yeah it's beautiful yeah it's you know i i really truly feel that a lot of times we know what we what what can serve us and we don't choose it because no other reason than unconscious patterns run human behavior, right? Yeah. And that's why I always tell people read Charlie Monger's 25 Cognitive Biases. Charlie Monger is Warren Buffett's business partner, one of the richest men in the world. Okay. Um, and and he, he really shows you what happens in, you know, modern day psychology when we decide things based on phenomenons and, and what errors, like these cognitive biases are really just errors in our right. program. Right. And the errors play themselves out where we talk about past successes, but not in a way that actually serves us. Yes. Right. We talk about us in a self-worth battle, right? Well, I used to have like a six pack and now I don't. I used to do that for years because I was a college wrestler. I wrestled at the University of Chicago and I was an all-state wrestler in high school. 
And for most of my life, I was like six or 7% body fat. Like, right. And when I left college and I got into sales, I got unhealthy because I would just eat and sit. And that's why a lot of what I teach in sales is standing up and being healthy. Right. Yeah. Um, but I always used to say, oh, I, I, I used to leverage my past because one of the cognitive biases is leveraging your past in a way that it's an error where you don't do anything about it. Right. Because you're living in the ego about where you were instead of being honest with yourself about what you want. Yes. Right? And so sometimes we, we, we want to look good. And so in our language, we say we want things. And in the end of the day, we don't realize that unconsciously, even if we want those things unconsciously, we, we keep doing the same patterns that don't serve us. And that's why I truly feel that if you want to change anywhere where you are, you have to get aware of what you're unaware of. Up, yes. Right. The things you don't know, you don't know. And that's what I think the biggest benefit of hiring a coach is, is that if you want to get aware of what you're unaware of, the easiest way is to hire someone that's looking in the game. Yeah. And an example of this and for your audience and listeners, I mean, whether you like sports or not, you know, look at Phil Jackson. He only won two championships as a New York Knicks player. But when he coached Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, the two best players besides maybe LeBron James in the game of basketball, mm -hmm. he won a, he won nine rings, right? Yeah. Two of them or like six with uh, Jordan and five. He won 11 rings. Actually, that's why his book was called 11 rings. And he actually won two himself. So he really won 13 rings, right? Damn. So how did this basketball player that didn't have the results that these other guys do assemble a team and win more championships? Well, you know, you don't have to technically have the results in order to coach someone because of this idea of an impartial spectator, someone who's looking outside in the stands into your game that can identify things that you can't see because they're in like your car's blind spot. Yes. Right? Like when we are driving a car and we have a mirror, we can't see what's in our blind spot. We literally have to look over our shoulder. And that's what a coach does is look over your shoulder for you without you turning your head. I and love that analogy. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. I go through it all the time because I'm like, I'm, I love to help people and I'm always there to coach. But then when it comes to me, I'm like, but I know this stuff, but why can't I get it for myself? Ah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's the truth is I have five coaches myself and I'm a coach, right? Right. So why do I have five coaches? Well, uh, you know, hate him or like him. There's a lot of people who you know, don't like the polarizing online figure Ty Lopez because of his egotistical centered videos about cars and women and all that stuff, which he literally uses for marketing purposes and is doing something correct because if he has people talking about him, whether that's negative or positive, that's what I say. All negative or positive, no such thing as bad, uh, bad uh, media or bad, yep. or bad uh, journalism, right? Um, people are talking about you, you're making money, you're growing, you're expanding. And so one, I actually have a, privilege to, you know, spend some time with him to consult him for some, for free. I, I didn't know what I was signing up for. I didn't know who the guy was. I, I just knew his copywriter was super heart centered guy was very successful in copywriting. He's a friend of mine. And I decided to just, he's like, Hey, I work with this big internet marketer. I build all his funnels. His name was Sean Boster. Actually, you guys should check him out. He's one of the best online marketers I've ever seen. Best copywriters I've ever seen in my life. Oh my gosh. Okay. And um, he brought me to Ty Lopez's like Beverly Hills mansion that he rented. And, uh, and, you know, I spent the day with him and I got to know him. And one of the things, if you, listen, if you can't learn from someone you don't like, you can't learn from someone at all. Right. right. Really got to consider if you don't like something about them, whether you're right or wrong, being right doesn't transform your life. Being right doesn't get you in a better place where you're more purpose driven and helping people. Being right doesn't actually serve us yet we hold on to it like it's the last thing and we'll go to the grave to be right versus being in relation versus making an impact, right? So a lot of people are right about right, their yeah. relationship with their ex. They're right about their relationship with their mom or their dad. And they are all mirrors. So it's like, what are you not acknowledging in yourself that is happening with that other person that you're not liking? Yeah. So it like really all comes down to you at the end of the day. Yeah, it all comes down to you and, 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 you know, we all mirror each other and sometimes it's something you got to shift within yourself. And sometimes it's not something you have to shift yourself, shift yourself. It's more of something you, you have to shift in your perception of how you're looking at it and how it can be for you instead of happening to you. Yeah. And I think when people complain or are negative or they talk down about people, 
that they're right about because they don't display the image of humility or whatever society says a good person is. Um, they don't realize that, you know, them doing that isn't serving the collective and the purpose and it really doesn't give them any utility. And so it's actually an error in their perception and that they should shift their focus on what they can learn and how they can grow and how they can use this as a benefit to help other people instead of putting someone down and being negative and contributing to the problem instead of looking for the solution. So right. Ty Lopez taught me one thing and, I, and your whole audience, if they took this one thing from this podcast, it would make a huge difference is here's a guy that's making millions and millions of dollars, you know, in the online space. And he has five coaches. He has a coach for fitness. He has a coach for copywriting. He has a coach for business. He has a coach for, uh, you know, building a team in his company. He has a coach for his spirituality. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I truly feel that our unconscious pattern, what is our unconscious patterns as human beings? Well, if you look back 5,000 years ago when you were in the Assyrian empire and someone came to your land and wanted to take your land, what did they use? Well, they used brute force. They used mm -hmm. killing. They killed you for resources. Right. And unfortunately that's how life was for thousands and thousands of years. And here we are fast forward four or 5,000 years later and we think that we're in a dangerous time with all that's going on. And it's unfortunate with all that's going on but if you really look at the grand scheme of life, it's actually the safest time to ever be alive, even with the pandemic, even with all of the unfortunate things that are happening with, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, violence in the world and feminicide in Mexico. I hate hearing all that stuff that's happening, all the tyranny and the extortion and the violence and the killing and all of that unnecessary stuff that doesn't serve us as a, as a collective. But the truth of the matter is if you can put that aside and just look at the facts and not make it about me trying to yes. shift your perception and it doesn't matter to those things. I'm not saying none of those things matter. I'm saying it's tremendous. It all matters. Absolutely. And at the same time, you look at the facts, we're in the safest time to ever live in society. Absolutely. Yeah. But and you have to go brain. through the dark to get to the light. So I don't think people acknowledge that either. Yeah. And that, yeah. that time that I've had people Say come to me. That. I would love to hear it. Say more on that. I love that. Yeah, no, I've had people, you know, come to me and just are like, well, how, how do you stay so positive and why are you so happy? And why do you, and I'm like, because it's a choice. It really is. And, um, and like you said, life happens for you, not to you. And when you really believe that and you live your life through that, your whole world shifts and your whole world changes and you live from a different perception and then that's go bringing it back to perception perception is everything perception creates your reality your thoughts become things so when people are in this time of covid and really focusing so in on these little details that they're being fed and spoon fed by these media companies and news stations and hello the elections coming up and all these extra things and I have been researching mad things for 15 years when I was 13 years old I watched the secret I watched that stuff a long time ago because I just at when it, bringing it back to religion I didn't believe that we were so separated and that they were there and they were there and we were here I just thought it was bullshit to be honest and so it led me into this deeper like um, search for for answers and seeking and wanting to know more I could go way way deeper into all that because like I'm definitely into you know quantum physics and the science of things and um, Joe Dispenza I love him I'm obsessed with his teachings um, and and I go deep into the whole alien side and and the energetics because it really is there is light and dark in everything um, there's we're in this 3d reality right now but we are really shifting I believe into more of a 5d and you can look at that as a negative uh, or positive way because there are it's being that word is being used and languaging in both uh, avenues of wherever you want to take it but I believe that w from the light side of things that we are really going through this shift and the darkness and this pandemic and all these horrible things because it needs to be brought into the light so that it can be healed and that we can all start shifting and living healthier and better and high vibes and yeah I love that I love that yeah it's all raising awareness you know what we're unaware of we can't really shift and that's what I love about coaching and what I took away from Ty is that you need coaches to, to point those things out where you can grow and expand because we're all just victim to the survival from the past of having yeah. to accumulate resources with violence. And so, you know, when we are on, so human beings by design are cynical and reserved. 
So mm -hmm. we don't trust each other or what's going on. And we actually get res resignation about it to the extent where we don't do anything. And that's why it's so difficult for us without coaches, without habits that we develop that serve us over time to shift our behaviors. And I'm actually a really big Joey D, uh, Joe Dispenza fan. I actually had a really bad uh, kickboxing injury a year and a half ago. And I was bedridden for like two months and I got deeply, deeply obsessed with Joe Dispenza and his meditations. And they really altered my life in a way that was profound where I really feel I rewired genetic like, yes that's the thing that's a thing it happens <laughs> when brain. you believe it though i have believed i'm like I have, that was my first tattoo was my mom's writing and believe because every uh, sorry i pulled away from the mic there but uh when you believe it 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 happens you can fucking change anything and that's why if people could understand that concept and i think more people are shifting into that and realizing that it's not about seeing to believe it's about believing to see I love that. I really love that. That's that's really good because, you know, a co what is a co we talked about cognitive bias on the call earlier. What is a cognitive bias? Well, it's something that when you see an information or a phenomenon or an event that occurs in your life, you decide something about it, right? Mm -hmm. And in that de that that decision, you really create a perception and a point of view, a lens and a and a meaning behind what you're seeing. And you will go in your life and look for proving yourself right with that meaning to the extent where it doesn't really serve what you're up to and who you right. are as a person for the world. Right. And so we're all just victims of our cognitive biases that get developed by these phenomenons that we're exposed to in our environment and they shape our personality. And the cool thing is if they don't, if it doesn't serve you, the first step is awareness. Like one of my mentors, John Astroff, I had the honor and privilege to be coached by him in the session. And he talked about, he spent, he does, does some amazing stuff with his uh, neuro gym where he retrains your mind and whatnot. And he, he built like a huge, I think billion dollar real estate agent team in California and made a crap ton of money and sold his business and realized how much he was operating out of fear and all these unconscious patterns and he decided to go on this path of rewiring his subconscious mind so that his self image could be, uh, you know, up to the level of his worthiness of whatever he wanted in relationships and business and life. And he's on this amazing path that it's to help people rewire all those subconscious programming that really become, you know, automatic from our past and just keep running who we are. And that's why I love people like Joe Dispenza and John Astor because they show you the different elements of how you can actually shift your personality, how you can shift your behavior. And right. In tangible ways happen. and making it happen. Yes. Yeah. Real absolutely. Way. yeah. It's tangible and, and it's changing millions of people's lives. And I, I feel like there's just not enough of that when we're brought up in society. I feel like we're lied to. We're taught to go to school, get a job, work for somebody else, learn these low income skill sets so you can build someone else's dream, not yours. And that's why I teach high income skill sets. And the most important high income skill set is the ability to persuade and influence people. And it starts with influencing yourself through your own communication. And if you can influence yourself and change the way you think, and you're on that path to transformation where there's no top, right? There's a mountain right. with no top. And yesterday's transformation is tomorrow's ego trip. And yes. Like my, like my mentors teach me and you're on this path and you're taking people with you and you're coaching and training and you're getting coaching and training. And, you know, and, and that's what we all want to do is we want to self-actualize. We want to reach our potential. And the only way we can do is with each other. And a lot of times mm -hmm. we don't see that possible because we get into these modes where we perceive someone's hurting us or they did hurt us. And we can't reframe it as this thing that can help us and serve us to, to, to assist others and not making, making sure they don't go through the same thing. Right. I right. really truly feel your mess in life is your message. My mess was communication and my message is helping people master their communication. And, and so they can take ownership of their life, their finances, and do what they want to do, travel, work remote, uh, give back, start a nonprofit, you know, live yeah. your best life, like they say. 
Yeah, and you you said it's funny because I'm going to reframe your words here. You said persuade, and I think people yeah. come from the wrong context with that in sales. And it's all about when you're saying those words in languaging. Obviously, we we have to perceive it in a certain way, but it's all about your intention and where you're coming from while you're while you're selling and while you're persuading. But it really is not a bad thing when you're coming from a good place. I, yeah, so I, I, I like to just preface with that. Um, and I wanted to dive into, you know, people I think don't, they don't really realize that gratitude and giving back is also what so sets a tone for you to really be able to shift and move forward. And that brings me into um, through you.org. I would love to talk about that with you really quick. Um, I know we don't have tons of time. We've got about like 10 minutes, but if you could dive into to more about that and, and how I can give back, how we can get involved in stuff, because I think that is so freaking cool and more people need to um, be be more aware of of what they do have and what they should be thankful for and how they can give back yeah totally thank you for asking for the, about that so um you know obviously growing up my family were refugees from iraq i always heard that they didn't really have clean water when they were in the villages they didn't have electricity and life was really hard and for me the truth of the matter was my family worked so hard to get me out of that frame of reference and put me in you know get get us out of the at age 10 we moved, we moved out of the ghetto we moved to a nice place my mom was poor but she like she wanted to make sure we were in a safe place so she literally had a condo in one of the richest areas in michigan just so she can get us out of the ghetto and it was funny because you thought we had money because we were in the same zip code but when you went in our house we had zero furniture mm. and and we used to and we used to just heat the house with ovens we used to uh, you know, we used to cut off, we, we used to not have air conditioning most of the time. Um, and, you know, and we were on 70 cent lunches at school. So nobody knew that we were really poor, but it was like the, you know, people who like flex for no reason. They have like yeah. hundreds on the outside and singles on the inside. My mom did that not because of an ego thing, but to actually protect us from violence in Detroit and move us into an environment where she knew if we were around smart, successful people, like the parents of the schools we went to. Like right. my, my, my friend's parents, right? They were all doctors, dentists, lawyers, surgeons, you know, and business owners. And she knew if she put us in proximity that that would rub off on us. And she was right. You yeah. know, she's little did I know, without a book, without a personal development book, without a coach, without a seminar, my mom knew that proximity, like Tony Robbins says, is power. So yes, you gotta just take that first step too. And yeah. you don't have to see the full staircase, but just taking that step for you guys, I think was huge. Yeah, and so what, what, I didn't have this contextualization that my life was hard, even though I knew it was hard. But from the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that hard compared to what my mom was experiencing in these villages. And so I was like, you know, I made a lot of money in my 20s doing sales for, you know, a top Inc. 5000 company. And I became the top producer there. I, in commission, I got paid out over a million dollars in commission across a couple of years, you know. And so I, I, I saved a bunch of money. I invested in some real estate. I traveled the world. And then I just got present to like, after traveling to 25 countries, I became super depressed all of a sudden. And I didn't understand like, why am I depressed? I have a lot of money in the bank for my age, right? right. At least I, I felt that way. And I have some real estate, I've seen the world, like how come I'm in the middle of, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful Budapest. And I'm- I'm from there. I'm half Hungarian. <laughs> it's awesome that half. we're on the- I mean, I'm Canadian, but- <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> I, I remember you saying that. That's so cool. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny because I'm like in your home country and I'm like, literally it's the most beautiful place in the world. They have all these ancient rune bars and they have this beautiful architecture and they have these, these, these spas where spas are my favorite. Literally spas are the things that bring me the most happiness. And I'm sitting in a spa depressed. And I'm like, how am I depressed? And I just traveled the world at all these things. And I realized, man, everybody's chasing this one day. And mm -hmm. like, yes, is it fun to eat culture's food? Is it fun to travel and see new things? Yes. Is it cool to learn history and go to museums and architecture and talk with the locals? Yes. I'm not downplaying that. It's yes. a very exciting thing. But that goes right. to where we never get it done. We're always going to be moving forward to yeah. get to the next thing to evolve. I I got that lesson intellectually. I knew about that lesson that there's nothing to get. You got to fall in love with the process and progress. And I heard that a ton of times on a thousand podcasts and I never really enjoyed the journey. I never, 
right? You can intellectually understand something, but you can emotionally not get it. Yeah. And emotionally, I did not step into it. And I was just so depressed and I was so pissed off because I was like, this is it. I, what if I got this 20 years from now? Because most people spend 20 years to make a million dollars. Right. Here I am just a few years and I did it. And it's like, wow, you know, this can't be it. This can't be all it. And then so I went on this path to like discover who I was and what I am for the world. And I did a lot of transformational education. I did some seminars. I did some boot camps. I started hiring mentors. I started you know, working with coaches and I started working with energy healers and Reiki healers and bioenergy healers and people who were doing acupuncture. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how do I become happy? What's going on with my internal state that I'm not happy? And then I realized that I thought I had to get somewhere. You know, I thought there was this place I had to get and I had to show people how awesome I was. And no wonder I couldn't find the woman of my dreams. No wonder I was pushing women away because it was making it all about me. And I realized life is not about you and sales is not about you. And when I went to Mexico, I built a house in, in Ensenada with some buddies and I fell in love with that process. And I said, wow, I love this, but then I have no contact with the family. How do I improve upon this journey? And then I met one of my best friends, his name is Chris Vasquez. And uh, you know, he, he, I met him at a seminar and we learned about each other's transformation. And we were both depressed after traveling to 25 countries. We literally had the same life, same story, made wow. the same amount of money. We were the same, almost the same age. And I was like, bro, this is, this guy's my transformation brother. This guy helped me realize through each other's relationship that this isn't what life's about. And that life really happens for you through me and through you. And so we went to, we did, he, he, in the middle of the seminar, he said, I'm going to build a school in Africa and my boy, Johnny's going to help me. Who's in, who's in it with me? And yes. I, him, I said, I'm in it. I'm in it. I'll build a school with you, bro. And I didn't even know the guy. And I stood up in the middle of the seminar in front of 300 people. And I was like, and then I said it and I was like, holy shit. Yes. That energy you just, just surged. <laughs> That's when I learned the power of declaration. Even though I read it in books like Thinking You're Rich, I learned the power of declaration. And I declared I was going to build a school and I had no idea how to do it. Yep. But I believed and had faith that it was going to work out. And that's why I love the book, Think and Grow Rich. If anybody's listening, you have to read that book. You have to be religious with that book. I actually have a copy right next to me and I carry it everywhere I go. It's in my book bag. I wow. haven't read that yet. I got to read that. Hold on. I literally have read it probably 52 times. And I oh, I love it. Everywhere I go. <gasps> yes. I I've, I've, I go yeah, I've had friends that have told me to read it. So, okay, now I'm going to have to go get it. <laughs> so let me wrap up what I'm saying. So belief and faith is a big, a big, a big uh, theme in that book. And, you know, but I had the belief and faith. We had no idea how to build a school. And then we went to build a school. We figured it out. We worked with a company. We partnered with this nonprofit. And we took 18 beautiful souls with us. And 11 of them could not live life after we built that, uh, you know, school. I mean, the kids were banging on the bus. They had never even seen their own face. Uh, wow. they, they were looking at our phones. We took pictures. They never, they don't have mirrors. And wow. it, like, it was like, it blew my mind that these kids are so happy and they don't see what they look like. And I realized how much we make it mean something when we're not like someone else, or we don't look good, or we're not as, our hair is not as perfect as, as it could possibly be. And here they are, these kids are eating mango for breakfast and then Sema, which is just rice for dinner. And then they have the biggest smiles, by the way, they have whiter teeth than us because they don't have refined sugars. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, and so here these kids are, they, they have bad water, they have disease, they have malaria, the kids are dying, the parents are dying and they have nothing. And you, here they are banging on the bus, singing and dancing for us to welcome them in their village. We slept into their homes and we built this. And, and I, I never cried so much in my life. I thought I cried more when I was a kid, when I was in that village, <laughs> And they were singing the song. It was lemon, da, 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 e I E. Aww. And it was like singing for I us. I have shivers. Hours. Yeah. <laughs> they were singing for us for hours. And I was like, wow, I realized at that moment what it means to be a human being is what it means to be a human being is who I am for other human beings. Oh my God. And it's not about me. Yeah. It's about them. Yes. And that's when I got my first tattoo. It says estamos on my, on my arm. Cause it's like, we are in this, like it's we, right? Yes. Oneness. And, We're all connected. Yeah. And I gave up being this like egotistical, arrogant person. I committed to being this courageous, loving leader who attracts the most beautiful woman in the world that actually makes an impact in the world and changes people's lives and is committed to transformation and not about me. And since then I've made more income. I've, I've impacted more lives than I ever have. And now I'm on this journey to show people that it's possible too, that they just need to alter their context, not their content in sales. 
So when companies come, they're like, teach my guy scripts, my strategies. And I take, I say, yeah, I'll do that. I just straight up tell them I'll do that. And then I do that and I alter their content first. Yes. And, and then I get the, their wives are hitting me up. They're like, what did you do to my husband? What did you do? I've been working. On <laughs> what did you do? I've been working on it for 10 years. What happened? How did you do that? He's different. And I'm like, no, he's not different. He's just accessed more of who he is because now he has tools. That's yes. it. And that's what coaching, transformational education, the stuff that we don't learn in school. And that's what I'm on a mission of is providing that, that recontextualization of who you are for the world and get you out of scarcity and into purpose and out of survival and into your mission and out of your mess and into your message. And that's a oh. path and journey. You are just a freaking light warrior. And I'm so grateful that we have crossed paths. And this is so awesome. I'm so excited to like talk to you more and work with you more. So where can people Likewise. go um, to work with you and find your stuff personally? And then as well for um, through you.org. Yeah, you can go to through you.org or through you org on Instagram. And you can okay. hit us up. And, um, you know, if you're interested in building a trek for your team and, and recontextualizing what life's like for you and your team and having life be through you and through me, uh, you know, being your team members, being the me and, um, you know, you could hit us up and we can plan a trek. And, um, if, you know, if you want to work with me in, if you're a sales team, you're an entrepreneur and, or you're just a salesperson or you want to get in sales, but you had things like it's too hard. It's not for me. I don't have the personality. Um, I don't like selling. Selling makes me feel weird. I don't like asking people for money. Those are all perceptions and stories of selling things you don't believe in, selling things you're not passionate about. And so I would love to, even if you don't work with me, to alter the way you even see sales and realize that sales is everything. And the most successful people who are happiest and own their freedom in their life have learned and mastered this skill set. And I can teach you how to do it in a way that's authentic, that doesn't sacrifice who you are and actually feels good where you can sleep at night and really change a lot of people and make a lot of money in the process. So you can hit me up on Instagram at the Johnny Anton or johnnyanton.com. That's J-O-H-N-N-Y-A-N-T-O-N.com. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Johnny. This was so great having you. I will definitely have you back again and we will definitely be chatting more this week. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it was very valuable for, for your community and I'm blessed to have you as a friend and I'm so glad we crossed paths. I'm so excited to learn more about you and explore who you are and your journey and what path you've been on. I've heard a little bit, but I'd love to hear more and I'm just excited to collaborate more and, and expand our friendship and our network together absolutely yay okay cool you guys thank you so much for joining us again this was quantum magic tv we are here every monday at 12 p.m pst so make sure you stay tuned and join us have a great rest of your guys's day bye